Moto. If you want to follow along with those, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you know you want to write it down, you can. It's gonna feel like we're moving more quickly through this, and we kind of are. But it's not because it's like, oh no, the end of the school year is here. Quick, we gotta. Hurt. No, I knew the end of the school year was here. It's not a surprise to me. <laughs> okay, it shouldn't be a surprise to you. But um, the thing is with vertebrates, this is the stuff you grew up learning about on Animal Planet Discovery Channel, right? Advanced genetics, cellular metabolism and processes. Nobody watches that on the Discovery Channel. Amphibians and reptiles, everybody watches that on the Discovery Channel when they're six years old. So it's going to seem like we're moving quickly. And we kind of are because you guys have a better foundation with this than you probably would give yourselves credit for. So we are going to go kind of quickly through this. But at any rate, we're going to talk about vertebrates. All the critters in the world that have a spinal cord, okay? Anything with a spinal cord. We're talking fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, you know, those kinds of things. And so things that you're more or less pretty familiar with. So a chordate is anything with a spinal cord. You just, you don't have to write that down. It's something with a spinal cord. All your chordates, this is probably the most confusing part of the whole chapter, is the first like two slides. <laughs> so just that good there, it'll get clear. All chordates have four features at some point in their life, including you and me, including frogs, including fish, they're going to have these at some point. They might lose them. They might look different in different organisms. It might be when they're an embryo, but it doesn't matter. They're going to have these four things. At some point in their life, they're going to have a hollow nerve cord that runs the length of their body. You and I had this hollow nerve cord when we were an itty bitty teeny tiny baby in mom and it developed into the spinal cord housed inside your vertebrae that you still have today okay um ends at your brain ends at this teeny tiny tailbone called your coccyx okay so they have to be a big nerve that runs straight down the back okay almost all of these organisms it's enclosed within a bony uh skeleton made of vertebrae there's a couple in the ocean that like don't they have a, some other mechanism of support but basically if you say spinal cord you're all right with me the next thing is some sort of notochord a notochord is a long supportive rod so again now we're saying there's something in their body that basically runs straight down the middle that holds them rigid okay again for all intents and purposes, the stuff we're going to talk about, we're going to leave the like two exceptions alone, which are like fish in the ocean that are like this long and shaped like a pencil. Leave those guys alone and just write spinal cord, vertebrae, backbone, and you're in great shape, okay? Uh, and then the tough one, pharyngeal pouches. Um, you're at a point in your education where you actually know the word pharynx, uh, which is cool. Uh, the pharynx was the tube between your mouth and your throat and your nose, this hollow space. Uh, behind your mouth and you saw that on an earthworm and, and that kind of stuff which was cool so pharyngeal pouches are some sort of paired structure near the head that will become something later on uh, they're most obvious in fishes because they stay there and they become gills in other organisms they become lungs they differentiate into you know different uh like they start off as a pouch when when most organisms are like a little bundle of cells in the hundreds to thousands of cells right and as they differentiate out, they become things like thyroid glands and, and you know, esophagus and all of these kinds of different things. Um, so pharyngeal pouches don't last that long on most critters we're going to talk about. And then all chordates have some sort of muscular tail that extends beyond the anus. Um, obviously, you know, in uh, you know, some primates, uh, in monkeys and stuff, the, the tail could go very, very long beyond uh, the anus. Um, with us, you know, we had a tail in our development as an embryo uh, that was almost as long as the rest of our spine. And it was cool because we looked like an iguana. It was awesome for like four days and it was gone. <laughs> Dang it. We grew into it. You know, it looks really cool for a while. And it's like, you look like a little, little butterfly when you're developing and then you get your spinal cord grows out and you're like, I've got a tail. And then you grow to catch up to the spinal cord and you're like, Oh man. And you have a little coccyx, which is like that big. Ah, there goes the tail, I guess, whatever. So that's a muscular tail. Uh, fishes, they have a muscular tail, extends beyond the anus. Not that hard to figure out, right? Um, I think that's all we need to say about those four things. If you don't memorize those, it probably won't be the end of the world, but know that we're talking about critters with a spinal cord, so there's kind of a no-duh. Out of the organisms on the face of the planet, 
the ones with spinal cords get our attention. We have spinal cords. Most of the animals we raise for food production have spinal cords. Um, and, but, you know, really that's a very small percentage of the world's animals. Uh, so many of the world's animals are insects, you know, that have no spinal cords, <laughs> invertebrates in, uh, in freshwater and saltwater and, uh, you know, soil. Um, so many of the animals are bacteria. And in this itty bitty, teeny, teeny, tiny, ah, I shouldn't say bacteria, technically an animalia kingdom, I shouldn't have said that. That's okay, whatever. A teeny tiny percentage are the critters with the backbones that you and I are familiar with, and we are included in those numbers. So examples are the stuff that you guys are already kind of familiar with. Um, they are fish, they are amphibians, they are reptiles, they are birds, they are mammals. I apologize for looking away from the screen, that's rude. I'm checking the time on my phone. Uh, we're gonna take these one at a time. So like I said, it seems like we're clicking quickly, but really like you guys know that birds have feathers and fly unless they don't fly and that fish have fins and swim. So it's not like we need to really, you know, take a ridiculous amount of time. So here's a kind of nameless, shapeless chordate and uh, all of the structures that he should have. Um, he's gonna have some sort of musculature. He's gonna have a tail extending beyond the anus, which was in that list. He's going to have a notochord that is some sort of supportive structure that makes him rigid, uh, which in 99% of the critters we're talking about, vertebrae making a spinal cord. Hollow nerve cord is the nerves that run from his brain throughout his body. And almost all of the time, they're gonna run through the bones of the vertebrae because vertebrae are awesome because they keep your spinal cord safe. And that's the point of them. Um, they're still going to have mouth, pharynx, anus uh, all the way around, just like the earthworm did, but we're going to have pharyngeal pouches, which depending upon the animal can become a great many different things. So that's your, I don't know what, how great that thing is, but there's a general description of you know, what these guys could be. So let's talk about how we break these out. I mean, even though it's only four to five percent of animals, it is still so many animals. So how do you, you know, how do you classify these things? And uh, the answer is there's, there's many different ways uh, based on how they live and grow and reproduce. But one of the easiest ways is to talk about, oddly enough, how they make their body temperature or don't make their body temperature. You, I'm guessing you don't know the word ectothermic, but you definitely know the word cold-blooded from when you were a kid, right? Everybody learned this on Discovery Channel. Like there's cold-blooded animals and warm-blooded animals. There's like a, a lizard on a rock and he's like waiting to warm up. Or in South Dakota, you see the bull snake on the blacktop asphalt that some truck ran over. And you're like, why was the bull snake on the blacktop asphalt? Because that stuff warms up fantastic in the morning. And the snake is super cold. So he goes out, stretches out on that black asphalt, just feels that heat radiating up through his belly, just radiating up. It feels so good. And then boom, boom, dead, you know, down with the truck. So that's, that's ectothermic. Their blood is not actually cold. That's a dumb name. Their blood's the temperature of their environment. If it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit outside and you're a lizard, your blood is 90 degrees Fahrenheit and you're going to be running super fast. If it's 20 below zero and you're a lizard, you should probably be burrowed in the mud hibernating because your blood will not be flowing that well at 20 below zero. So that's a cold-blooded critter. They don't generate their own body heat. There are some advantages here. Their metabolism, generally speaking, is many times slower than our metabolism. So as far as like efficiency with the food they eat, they're incredibly efficient. The downside is in the winter, you must hibernate or die, whereas humans get the ability to shiver and warm ourselves up and wonder when will spring return because I would just rather be able to hibernate and just be awake in the awesome parts of the year. So if you're a human like you and me or you're a dog or a bear or a cat or I don't, I've only listed mammals, let me think about this. Fish are cold-blooded, reptiles are cold-blooded, amphibians are cold-blooded, birds, duh, sorry about that. If you're a bird or a mammal, you'll generate your own body heat. Birds insulate with their feathers, which you've all seen in the winter time. They kind of look like little puff balls when they come to the feeder because their feathers are all puffed out. Those guys are warm blooded. They're using the feathers to insulate them against the cold, just like a nice down winter coat would keep you warm. The down is literally bird feathers that we've plucked out of dead birds and placed into a jacket or a pillow, but there's really not a great reason to have a really good insulated pillow unless you're back packing. I don't, whatever, whatever. Anyways, warm-blooded critters generate their own body heat. Birds, 
mammals and you and I. Uh, the cool thing is we get to not sleep all winter unless you're a bear. The bad thing is we are going to burn 30 times more calories than the, you know, lizard in your turtle tank or the turtle in your turtle tank at home. And so we just have to eat all the time, like when we're social distancing at home. And you're like, well, I'm bored. What should I do? I guess I'll eat more. Hmm. You know, story of my life. I don't know. Maybe you guys are in the same boat. Got to go uh, burn 30 times more calories than a lizard. No. Okay. Any questions over warm blooded or cold blooded? Or is that like old news? Okay. Thumbs up. That's what I'm talking about. Old news it is. So here's something that might be new. Uh, do you see this little canine here? I'm guessing that's a dog. That looks dog like to you, wouldn't you say? Okay. See this canine here? All of the tan is his axial skeleton and all the blue is his appendicular skeleton. And so we're going to talk about the skeletal system because it's very comparable across animals actually. So it's going to seem very general, but just bear in mind, the same thing works for primates and people and elephants and horses and birds, okay? Your axial skeleton and your appendicular skeleton. You've probably heard when you were, you know, a little elementary school student or middle school student that the earth rotates on its axis at like 23 degrees. And the axis of the earth was this imaginary line that kind of cut straight through the circle that was the earth. That's an axis, okay? The axis of, a, of an organism, if I was standing up, you could draw a straight line from the top of my head straight down. That would be my axis. And if I tipped on my axis like the planet, here I go. <sighs> my axis is still a straight line down from my face. So the axial skeleton is your skull and your vertebrae, essentially. Your ribs are connected to your vertebrae. It's a bunch of connective tissue and muscles in between there. So if you want to throw ribs in, be my guest. It's not going to hurt my feelings any. But as long as you get the idea that your vertebral column essentially is the line that splits you in two, you're in good shape. Now the appendicular skeleton are your appendages, okay? Appendages are like arms and fingers and legs. And all of those appendages are hooked into your axis. So this is my appendage, okay? It's got all these, it's got all these cool abilities, right? But I must hook it to my spine. So up here in my pectoral girdle, I have this big thingamabobber called a scapula. And that scapula anchors the wiggly parts to my backbones. Does that kind of make sense? So the wiggly parts can wiggle, but my backbone is the rigid axis about which all of the things need to move, okay? So that's an appendicular skeleton. Um, arms, legs, flippers. I don't know what else there is. That's probably it. Wings. Okay, we got it. Uh, so, which, I mean, what's a wing except for a skinny arm with feathers, right? Uh, did I give you enough time to write those things down that you wanted to write down? No, okay, thank you, Olivia. I'm gonna click back. I'm gonna give you a second and drink my cold tea. Mm. Cold tea is not good. Kind of like cold brew coffee, you know? It's like, well, it's, tastes like coffee, I guess. Good job. You did it. It just took you two days. <laughs> Hooray. Uh, okay. Don't sue me, cold brew coffee Starbucks. I know it's on YouTube and I have seven followers, so <laughs> don't sue me. Pretty big media influencer. Okay, Olivia, did I babble long enough for you to write what you need to write? Fantastic, clicking on, okay. So, a circulatory system. Uh, all your vertebrates are gonna have a closed circulatory system. Most of them have a four-chambered heart, which is like the icon of awesome circulatory systems. Four-chambered hearts are sweet because the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood never get to mix, which is so cool. All of your guys' deoxygenated blood, if you didn't know, goes into the right side of your heart. And the right side of your heart makes the short, short journey to your lungs right here. The lungs pump the blood back into the left side of your heart. And that's just oxygenated, which is awesome. And the left side of your heart pumps it to your entire body, which slowly sucks the oxygen out and puts the carbon dioxide back in which goes to the right side of your lungs where it doesn't touch the left side and is put back into your lungs. The CO2 leaves, fresh oxygen comes in and you are super efficient that way. So it's awesome. We're talking about a closed circulatory system. Uh, so arteries and veins are words you probably already know. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Okay. Veins carry blood back to the heart. Okay. So 
Uh, what's some you probably already know? Got it. Carotid artery. It's deep. It's like right there. Carries oxygenated blood from my heart up my neck and feeds many, many small branches throughout my brain. After the blood has had oxygen pulled out, CO2 put in, the jugular vein, which is right next to the carotid artery, jugular vein drains deoxygenated blood back into the heart. They're not always given different names when they're so close together. Like, oh, let's see. Oh, femoral. Femoral artery, femoral vein. Subclavian artery, subclavian vein. Abdominal aorta, inferior vena cava. That's a bad example. Never mind. Okay, ignore the bad example. Uh, take anatomy, and we'll have that discussion. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, capillaries. The teeny tiny, itty bitty, super small blood vessels where os osmosis, wrong, diffusion, where diffusion moves oxygen and CO2 back and forth between the cells. The capillary, I probably already said this and I apologize for repeating myself, but the, the capillary is about the same diameter as a single strand of cotton candy. If you've ever seen cotton candy spun up at the fair, if you touch it, it crushes because it is so small. And uh, that's how big your capillaries are. There are capillaries literally everywhere from the muscle tissue in your heart to your brain to your, I don't know, liver, skin cells, uh, everywhere. Everywhere has capillaries. I don't know if I, I, that's probably an exception. I shouldn't say that. Uh, tendons and ligaments have poor vasculature. That's an example. Anyways, uh, your blood in your vertebrates is going to be red. Uh, it's red due to a pigment called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that actually binds to oxygen in your blood, giving it a red hue. Uh, you've probably heard that blood inside your body is blue. And that's why your veins look all blue looking through your skin. It's, that's, it's not technically actually blue. Uh, it's like a deep red or a purplish color um, when it's deoxygenated. But since only certain pigments of light can escape through your skin, it gives it a very close to blue appearance. Um, the deoxygenated blood, if you ever donated blood at a blood drive, it's that color. It's not a bright, bright red. It's like a dark brownish purplish. So anyways, now you know the the cardiovascular system essentially uh kidneys have a lot to do with your blood uh in your vertebrates i'm trying to think of exceptions i'm happy with this in your vertebrates they're going to pump their blood to their liver the liver is going to do a lot of cleaning in that respect they're going to pump their blood to their uh lungs which is going to oxygenate it and they're going to pump their blood to their kidneys and the kidneys will actually push out blood plasma which is the fluid portion of the blood no red blood cells no white blood cells no platelets just the fluid in the blood gets pushed out and filtered the organism reabsorbs the things it wants to keep in its body like i don't know uh calcium sodium water those kinds of things but the things it wants to get rid of, urea, uric acid, nitrogen-based waste, water, those kinds of things, end up collecting down oftentimes, but not always, into a urinary bladder and then being excreted as urine. There are animals without a bladder, a couple of them, but that's, that's pretty much it. So the kidneys, if you're curious, like why are kidneys on the cardiovascular slide? I thought they made pee. They do make pee. They make pee from your blood. So that's why. Interesting, huh? Okay. Uh, vertebrate nutrition. Words you probably already know. I'll just let you kind of look through those. Just tell me if you know these. Just give me a thumbs up if you already know those. I got one thumb, two thumbs, three thumbs, four thumbs, five thumbs, peer pressure. Now you just have to put your thumb up or you feel bad. Only kidding. We did this in ecology. We even threw, what did we throw in there? Detritivores and... um. What was the one we did with bacteria? Oh, yeah, saprophytes. Anyways, whatever. Carnivores eat meat. Herbivores eat plants. Omnivores eat both. And there you have nutrition for your vertebrates. We're not going to spend much time there because, like I said, you guys all learned this when you were just little bitty peoples. And uh, you already knew that. So uh, vertebrate reproduction. Now, here's another way you can split them apart. This is fascinating. Um, when we get to vertebrates, between friends, we're basically... Are we? 
we're past the point of chopping an animal in half and having them regrow two animals. You cannot pull that trick when you have a spinal cord. It just, it doesn't work, okay? No more chopping things in half. That's mean. Let them make babies on their own and, you know, and just that's the way nature works when you're a vertebrate. So there's a couple of options for reproduction in the vertebrates. We're no longer doing asexual reproduction. We're doing sexual reproduction at this point. So birds and bats and elephants and, you know, what a fish, okay? They've got to do this deal. So you got two options. Option one, external fertilization. Option two, internal fertilization. If you didn't already know, this is biology. So I, I don't even know if we've talked about this. I feel like we have. Fertilization is the union of sperm and an egg cell. That's fertilization. Whether you are a plant or an animal, fertilization is the same. A sperm cell reaches an egg cell, fuses the two nuclei, you have a diploid zygote, and you're on your way to becoming a baby, whatever, pick an animal, that's fertilization. So external fertilization is this is happening outside of the body. Fish can be, most oftentimes, a good example of this. Uh, fish makes a bed, in the moss or shallow gravel. Mom fish digs a shallow bed with her belly by like swimming in it. She deposits eggs. Dad fish shows up, covers the eggs in milt, which is essentially his sperm cells plus some other enzymes. Um, the eggs are fertilized and mom and dad fish, you know, die in the river in Alaska, and the bear drags them out of the water and eats them and fertilizes the soil, and brand new baby salmon hatch weeks later to start their lives in the creek. You've all seen that on TV, I assume. That's external fertilization. It's outside of the body. Internal fertilization is sperm has to be placed into the female's body. The eggs are fertilized in the body, and then the options are almost limitless. They can lay an egg. They could give live birth with a placenta. They could form an egg that hatches in their body and comes out alive. I mean, it just depends on the animal. There's so many options here. But basically, sperm has to get into the female's body. So we're talking, you know, dogs, uh, birds. I think all birds work this way. Birds, um, pretty much all your reptiles are going to work this way. Um, and all mammals? I get so nervous with the word all because I know some weird freaky exception out there, but I'm going to say all mammals, okay? They're all going to work with internal fertilization. So there's a little bit of a difference uh, there as well. So now's the fun part. How are we doing on time? Oh, not great. Okay, that's okay. We got three minutes. We can do this. Here's the cool part. There's a few methods of development. The first one's called oviparous, okay? Ovum, ova, ovi, whatever means egg. Okay, so oviparous is the one that comes from the egg. So oviparous is an animal that's going to be essentially laid in an egg outside of mom's body and is going to hatch outside of mom's body. So birds, chickens lay eggs. Uh, that baby chick develops in the egg. It absorbs its yolk, becomes big and strong, cracks out of the egg with its teeny tiny tooth on the top of its beak and comes out into the world ready to go. Reptiles, the egg is a little soft and leathery and weird, longer, and we don't make omelets with them, does the same exact thing. Internal fertilization, mom lays the eggs, not necessarily so much like broodiness, like I have to sit on my eggs now, mom might kind of ditch, or sometimes she'll hang around to protect the nest, and then, you know, the baby crocodile chews his way out and hello, baby crocodile or baby sea turtle. We've all seen baby sea turtles on the Discovery Channel, right? It's like a massacre. It's so sad. You're just like, waddle, little turtle, waddle. The other option is viviparous. Uh, vivo means life. So these are the ones who are born alive, okay? So the live offspring nurtured most oftentimes by a placenta that's docked to a uterus, okay? We're talking primarily mammals at this point. We're going to leave <sighs> echidnas and platypuses alone for the, for the moment, okay? Pretty much most of the critters that you and I have experience with, like deer, cattle, and those kinds of things, are going to have a muscular hollow organ inside a mom called a uterus. Its job is to hold the kiddo as the kiddo develops. And when the time is right, 
the muscle contracts and pushes said kiddo out into the world. Now that kiddo doesn't have a yolk and an egg and a nest, but rather baby cow, baby deer, baby human, pick your favorite mammal, grows a placenta out that attaches to mom's inner lining of the uterus. And the placenta, which is essentially a big bed of blood vessels, is going to take oxygen from mom and take nutrition from mom, thank you mom, and is going to give waste products to mom and give carbon dioxide to mom, thanks again mom. So mom is now eating, breathing, and getting rid of waste for the baby. Pretty good deal. Kiddo is born, placenta is born, kiddo, you know, runs away and placenta breaks when it drops if it's like a giraffe right and uh starts its life ready to go or is eaten by a coyote i don't know you know pick a mammal like i said you know it's up to you and then the weirdest that i i know it's like we're at 2 30 but we're just going to do this last point and we'll quit it ovo viva paris which means the egg of life <laughs> the life the live birth egg birth what the heck is going on fertilized eggs stay in mom that's weird hatch inside of mom that's weirder then the young swim out alive that's so so strange garter snakes do this sharks do this sharks actually almost do all of these methods minus the placenta a shark can birth an egg that hatches like right out of the starting gate, if you will. A shark can have an egg that hatches inside of mom, outcompetes the growth for the siblings, and then births one live pup. And sharks can have eggs that what else are laid somewhere and hatch. So it's they, they can do apparently sharks can do whatever they want. I don't I don't I'm not a shark guy. I'm afraid of the ocean, and everything in it. So take that as what you will. Um, but yeah, that's open vivid pairs. They're the life egg, the egg that is also alive in mom. Um, and that's the three methods of 